Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all our viewers from around the world. My colleague um, each way and I will jointly host today's Stanford Global Energy Dialogue. Over the last three months, we have had extraordinary discussions with global thought leaders in energy that covered wide range of topics from impacts of COVID-19 to energy access and climate change. The videos of these dialogues can be found at GEF stanford.edu. No dialogue on global energy can ever be complete without a deep dive into China and India. Together, these two Asian giants comprise 36% of the world's population, 12% of the global GDP, roughly 30% of the world's primary energy consumption, and about 35% of the world's CO2 emissions. They are also among the fastest growing large economies in the world. The development path that China and India individually adopt will have serious consequences, not only on their own economy, security, and the environment, but of the whole world. E, over to you. Thank you, Alun. Um, to explain what is going on in these two Asian giants, China and India, we have two very special guests who are both iconic entrepreneurs and energy trailblazers in China and India, Sumang Sinha and Lei Zhang. Uh, let me introduce uh, both of them a little bit. Suma Sinha founded Renew Power in India in 2011, where he is the chairman and managing director. Renew Power is the largest renewable independent power provider in India. Um, Sumang is an engineering graduate of the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi. He went to the management school at the uh, uh, in Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta and Columbia University. And Lei Zhang was a graduate of the London School of Economics. He founded the Envision Group and uh, to the, 2007, which is now one of the largest renewable and digital energy companies in the world. In 2019, Envision acquired AESC, the battery arm of Nissan, making it a key player in electrification of transportation with batteries manufacturing in the United States, UK, Japan, and China. Envision has also been a significant investor in ChargePoint, AutoGrid, and many other energy startup companies. In many ways, Smart and Lei represent the future of clean energy transformation going on in China and India. In order to warm up everybody, warm up our speakers, our panelists, and warm up the audience, let's start by having a quiz in the poll uh, first. Uh, as of 2018, what fraction of the electricity generation in China came from renewable energy, including solar, wind, hydro, and biomass geothermal? Now this A, B, C, and D. Uh, please make your choice and uh, we'll give you uh, maybe five to 10 seconds. Okay, the answer is, let's see the poll, 25% um, or 35% is uh, on the select 25 and 45% select 12. Uh, the correct answer is 25%. I think the audience is getting close. Um, apparently in the last few years, the renewable energy development you know, has been quite exciting. According to BP statistic, statistical reveal, China generated over 7,000 terawatt hour of electricity, out of which 66% come from coal, 4% from nuclear, and three from natural gas, 3%. Out of the 25% renewables, hydro was 65%, solar and wind at 35%. In terms of annual growth rate, renewables grow at 29% highest, nuclear at 19%, gas at 
gas at 10%, coal at 6.5%. Remember the coal number is still 6.5%, even though it's uh, low, but it's still something right there. Um, let's do the quiz number two. As of 2018, what fraction of electricity generation used in India come from renewable energy? <clears throat> Similar thing, including solar, wind, hydro, biomass, and geothermal. So the poll come back, 49% of people think it's uh, 11%. Rank number two is 21% of people think it's 17%, and 20% of people think it's 5%. Uh, the correct answer is 17%. So you look at, compare the number of India and China, where well, China was at well, 25%, India is now uh, 17%. So India generated uh, 1,500, roughly 1,500 terawatt hour of electricity out of which 75% come from coal, 5% from natural gas, 3% from nuclear. So out of uh, the 17% from renewables, hydro was half. The rest was solar and wind. Electricity generation grew at 6.3% uh, annually, with renewables growing at 27% uh, and coal at 5.2%. If I look at the coal number, India and China, they're quite similar. The growth, India it was 5.2%, uh, China was 6.5%. Uh, um, so now come to our uh, panelists, Lei and Sumant. Uh, thank you both of you so much for joining us late at night for both of you. Um, it's early in the morning in California, so I think it's just a matching. We are just coming out from the, you know, from the dark, we are going to moving into the dark, right? So uh, this is a good time to have a conversation. Um, the pattern we see in China and India is that renewables are growing and annually at 25%. Yet it has a long way to go to catch up with coal, which is still dominating the coal is still dominating. Its growth is small, but not uh, negative. It's not negligible. It's still about five, six percent also. Now, Lei, uh, in your view, what do you see the pathways China will take in the next few decades in all aspects of energy? And how will it impact the world? We'll, we'll start from you. Thanks, Yi. Um, there are three mega trends in China energy industry. One is renewable energy development. The second one is digital. The third one is about market reform. And we are seeing these three mega trends are reinforce each other and create a magic effect. Renewable energy is going to be enabled by digital solutions. At the same time, China is making market reformation, especially for this trading system, to allow more renewable energy being taken. So we see such a fast development for the three mac trend especially for the next five years. China today is making the 15th five-year plan. We will see renewable energy is going to be significantly increased. Most important thing is by 2025, we will see all the renewable energy, including energy storage, will have will have much lower cost than fossil fuel. So this is going to pass the critical point for China energy industry. And then everyone will be very, will see the new reality. So I think that the new consensus could be, could be achieved 
in a few years' time, people believe this net zero strategy for net zero emission is durable for next 30 or 40 years. Thank you, Lei. I, I noticed in the last couple of years, you introduced a new term called synergy. And academia, yes. we use a synergy a lot. We collaborate with other people. We said coming from different areas, we call it as a synergistic. The synergy is used. Can you explain a little bit more about what you mean by synergy? Yes, sure. So uh, a few years ago, uh, when I think about the future of energy, so I, I'm considering two things. It's it's one is about the cost for energy. Another thing is about the cost of synergy. So even five or 10 years ago, I personally strongly believe we almost solved the cost for energy. So we are going to see two cents or one cents renewable energy. So today we are able to see two cents renewable energy already. So cost of energy is not going to be issue. However, when the renewable energy become the mainstream, so the energy system is going to be reshaped. It will become very much distributed. And also the energy source is very intermittent. So in such a renewable energy dominates the world. So supply and balancing is become very challenging, especially coupled with electric vehicles. This random behavior, child, charging behavior is also is adding more variables. So we at a stage need the new grid. Think about the nature of grid. Is physical grid is about connecting and balancing. So we need new tools, which is digital grid. So who it is able to connecting billions of renewable energy devices and also for this EV and the storage at the same time to achieve the new balance. So that's, that's a synergy become very important in a renewable energy dominated world. I guess what I understand is uh, now a different form of energy so strongly coupled together really forming a need to have a system level thinking. That's why you call it synergy. I think that makes a, a lot of sense. Let me, and uh, not about this supply side, especially the presumers. So you see the production and consumption are embedded each other, also in a much lower, you know, much detailed level. So such kind of synergy is also about supply demand synergy on local level. Yes, it makes sense. Now let me turn to uh, Sumant. Uh, Sumant, please give us a holistic view of the energy landscape in India, how that is changing in the future and how will that impact the rest of the world? Well, thank you, Eve. And I'd like to thank the Stanford uh, Peacock Center for inviting me for this panel discussion. Uh, it's terrific. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be on this show with um, Lee as well, because obviously uh, Envision is a major player in the renewable energy space. And uh, uh, in fact, we have a, we have a relationship with, the, with Envision as well, where they're supplying turbines to us. Um, you know, the question Eve, that you've asked is a very fundamental one. I think if you look at the Indian um, market, it is going through very fundamental change. And I might say that we are actually in the middle of a, a living through an inflection point in the power sector in India as we speak. Uh, so let me elaborate on that and tell you a little bit more about what's happening. Essentially the power sector in India, so far you talked about 1500 terawatt hours, um, which is the total size of the power market so far which equates to about 370 gigawatts of total power generating capacity. Of that, two thirds is coal-based power and about 90 gigawatts of that, so roughly about 20, 22% is renewable energy. And in that I'm not including hydro, so this is only wind and solar. Um, 
and that generates about 10% of the total electricity mix in the country. Now, what has happened is that because the cost of renewables has come down through technology development and innovations in the sector, we are now at a point where renewable energy, certainly in India, and as we all know, in many parts of the world, uh, has now become cheaper on a pure cost of generation basis than any other form of energy, of, of electricity. So it's certainly cheaper than coal, it's cheaper than nuclear, it's cheaper than hydro. Um, and I'm talking about new build for any of these uh, plants. And so, you know, when you look at India's per capita consumption, today, uh, India's per capita electricity consumption is only a third that of the global average. It's a quarter that of China's and about a 15th that of the US. And India is a developing country. We are a fast growing country. And so as we look to the future, the reality is that this number of per capita consumption is going to grow rapidly and is going to increase quite substantially. And so even if we forecast, let's say 10 to 12 years out, and we say that the per capita consumption of energy, of electricity in India, let's say doubles in this time period, that will imply essentially that we have to generate an additional 1500 terawatt hours in the next 10 to 12 years from whichever sources we can find. Now, to relate it back to the question that you asked, which is, what is the implication of India's energy choices on the world as a whole? The reality is that today, India emits almost eight to 9% of the total carbon emissions of, in the world. If we were to just simply replicate what we have done so far in terms of our electricity mix, into the next doubling that we are going to have, then obviously that number of 8% will go to 16%, 17%. And therefore all the emissions reductions that some parts of the world are trying to do will get negated by the increase in emissions from countries like India. And so therefore the choices that countries like ours make is very fundamental in terms of determining this whole emissions uh, scenario. And the reason we had an inflection point because of the cheapness of renewables implies that the good news is that the next doubling of our power sector in the next 10 to 12 years will be fundamentally different from the past 1500 terawatt hours that we have. And my feeling is, and my suspicion is, that if you look at the next 1500 terawatt hours, almost two thirds of that will actually come from renewable energy sources. And again, I mean only solar and wind. Now that would still mean that the balance 500 has to come from somewhere. And that 500 therefore will come from coal. So coal based power will continue to increase, but renewables will increase much more substantially. And so therefore, when you look at our power supply basket, let's say 12 years out, let's say 2032, at which point, let's assume we're at, at uh, 3000 terawatt hours uh, in, in aggregate of that, about a third will come from renewable energy, but 50% will still be coming from coal. So it'll still be a very large amount. But the good news is that the mix is shifting. And I think as we stretch the, the timeline out beyond 2032, if you go to 2042, 2052, I think that mix is gonna keep changing. Now there are of course a number of issues that we have to deal with. And we'll talk about that I'm sure as we go forward in this conversation. But the good news is that today, there is a solution that exists for looking at a fundamentally different creation of a uh, electricity sector than had been the case till very recently. And that is actually cause for optimism for us in the future. Very good, Saman. Thank you for your introduction to the uh, uh, Indian's uh, energy landscape. Now, let me turn back to Alun. Great. Um, Lay and someone, thanks for joining us. Um, you are both, you know, as I said, iconic and leading entrepreneurs, and you're deep in the trenches of the renewable energy transformation that is going on. And as we just found out, I mean, you are, the renewable energy sector is growing at more than 25% per year, which is absolutely staggering. So let me ask you on the challenges that you're seeing on the ground level. What are the bottlenecks that you see? that and if you remove them it will it could grow even faster and secondly as you look ahead what technologies and business opportunity do you see most promising 
and what technologies are missing. So, so give us the reality check of what's going on on the ground. Let me ask Sumant first, and then we'll move to Lay. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, so look, I think that um, in terms of the constraints, um, clearly there are a number of constraints. And um, sometimes it does feel that you're really in the trenches rather than above ground. Um, but um, just to highlight a few, uh, one of the problems in India is that uh, while there is this massive opportunity because of this market size, the growth of the country, and the relative scarcity of energy consumption right now, the reality is that the power sector in India is still an unreformed sector. There, has, there have been some reforms, but those reforms are clearly by no means complete. So our entire distribution side, the utility side, which faces the end customers, that whole sector is still unreformed and it is owned by different state governments of India. And the quality of management is not very good and the financial health of these utilities is not very good. And because they are the ones that we have to sign PPAs with, that, that uh, weakness in their financial health, unfortunately tends to feed back into us as well. And so we have to be very careful about how we manage our exposure to them and how we manage our financial situation and so on. So that's one issue. The second issue, Arun, is that, you know, when you look at the fact that we have today 370,000 megawatts of installed capacity from all sources of electricity today, coal, renewables, hydro, nuclear, bio, et cetera. The ask of the renewable energy sector is to create another 370,000 megawatts in the next 10 to 12 years. Megawatts Just or gigawatts? In gigawatts. In, 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 uh, sorry, 370,000 megawatts and 370 yeah. gigawatts. And so therefore, the, the, the physical aspect of executing this large amount of capacity in terms of land acquisition, in terms of connectivity, connectivity to the grid, in terms of actually buying the equipment and installing it, that is going to be pretty, I think it's going to be a pretty terrific ask. Um, certainly, we're happy to put our shoulder to the wheel and push at, as hard as we can. And I think not just us, but many companies will have to do the same uh, if we are to meet this target. And the third thing that we have to uh, also consider, which is very important, is if renewables go from 10% of the total grid to 30%, then the grid management itself and the grid build out itself will have to undergo some very fundamental changes. And today, I, while the government is doing a lot, taking a lot of steps to really improve their ability to manage the grid and you know, address the whole issue of intermittency, um, a lot of that management still has to play out. And so to, to segue a little bit into the second part of the question that you asked, which is what kinds of technologies therefore will be critical for, for renewable energy. I think the generation side is pretty clear right now. Costs are coming down. The visibility of the future is fairly clear cut. And so I think that's not an area that is going to require a lot of intervention. I think there is going to be a natural secular decline in costs as we go forward. I think the areas where there will need to be a lot of technology intervention is really in the, is in the area of intermittency management, where things like digital, I think that Leigh talked about earlier, is going to be very critical. And issues around storage solutions, whether it is through battery-based solutions or some kind of hydrogen-based solutions, I think that is going to be very critical to see. And I think thirdly, and we're not talking about that really right now, but is, uh, you know, it's an area also which consumes a lot of energy, is the mobility sector. And I think, again, there, uh, how hydrogen becomes part of that mix, whether batteries are the solutions, whether they're chargeable or replaceable batteries, I think those are things that still have to play themselves out. And I'm pretty interested to see how all of that, that whole sector evolves. But my hope is that a lot of that, whether it's hydrogen or battery charging, actually happens through renewable energy sources, because if we just do that charging through coal-based power, then actually that in some ways defeats the purpose. So I think those are the areas where I would see a lot of technology interventions going forward. Thanks, Suman. So Leigh, give us a reality check of what's going on in China. What are the bottlenecks? What are the opportunities? Where are the technologies that are missing? What technologies really you know, give you hope? So give us a give us a landscape. Uh, I think the biggest fundamental challenge is people's underestimation of how fast renewable energy could develop and how fast 
the renewable energy cost can be reduced. So I'll give you an example. So five years ago, when China made a five years plan for solar, they think they make an ambitious solar plan. So they want to increase 100 gigawatt solar within five years from 2015 to 2020. But it seems, so by this year end, China five year new installation for solar is going to reach 250 gigawatt. So people sometimes lack understanding this kind of nonlinear development of the renewable energy cost and also the penetration rate. So, you know, the consequence from this underestimation is about people are not proactively actively to design the policy, not proactively to make the market reform, market design to adopt more renewable energy. The financial institution will be more, less reluctant for divestment of fossil fuel assets and for education system and for co-work exit, all kinds of social things will not be planned in advance. So that's the challenge from this underestimation. So from the business model wise, as I said, synergy is become more cost of synergy is most important than the cost of energy. So digital solution definitely is going to be very important because it provides the flexibility of the system. At the same time, also, there's some physical flexibility can be provided by battery storage, EV as well. So from my point of view, once, one step ahead, when people think about what is the future energy company, I strongly believe, so when renewable energy take 50% or 80%, so the system risk become very high. The synergy cost will be extremely high. So the new company, new energy company will be the company help your customer to manage their energy market risk. So this type of company through the software, through AIoT, through this orchestration of multiple devices of renewable energy and also storage and the load devices together to create such a kind of virtual power plant or integrate EV with the digital network. This kind of company to provide risk management solution to your customer. So that's the new business model, what I strongly believe. Well, wonderful. Um, let me ask both of you. I mean, both of you are entrepreneurs you have started your businesses about roughly a decade ago, maybe a little bit more in, in Lay's case, and so on, you're, you're gonna be 10 years old next year. Um, and you've scaled them rapidly. I mean, this is an uh, unbelievable story for both of you. What are the, in your experience, what are the lessons that you have learned that you wanna share with other entrepreneurs regarding the ability to rapidly industrialize and the scale energy technologies and, and scale the businesses, because there's a, there's a, in a general concept that it's gonna take 20 years from any new technology or 25 years. How do you reduce the time, given that we have to address not only the market things that you later talked about, but also climate change. How do we reduce that to 10 years like you all have done? What are the lessons learned? Lay, you wanna go first? Sure. So from my personal experience is, so we start with wind turbines, but we take a different approach. We created the software defined wind turbines. So when we start with storage, we create a so network defined storage. So we combining software with hardware nicely. So you now most of product company so when they scale up, 
So they normally focus too much on the hardware or some software company, they purely work on the software solutions. So for energy business, especially playing with renewable energy system, I think the combination of software and hardware will give you a very unique advantage because for conventional product company, they are not very savvy on the latest AI, IOT, or big data technology. But for the typical software company, they are true IT house, but they are lack of understanding of physics and engineering things. So the company, if they want to be successful in this energy business, so I think it's better to combine the both. Terrific. Uh, Suvant, your thoughts? Yeah, Arun, I think, look, our sector, you know, we were very fortunate that when we started our company about 10 years ago, at that time, renewables in general was just beginning to become more a more important aspect. Uh, the whole issue of climate change was certainly becoming more relevant. And uh, we've seen some si significant growth over the last 10 years. Um, but uh, I think the growth that we've seen so far is nothing compared to the growth that is yet to come. And uh, therefore, my advice to any young entrepreneur looking at the sector is to get into it. It's not too late. I think it's still reasonably early days in our sector. The sector is going to scale up very dramatically. And therefore, there will be tremendous amounts of opportunities in whichever part of the value chain you get into. For example, if you're in the equipment manufacturing part of the value chain, like Lays, for example, or, or Envision is, then you can do some of the things that he talked about, which is combining software and hardware. If you're in our part of the value chain, which is the IPP part of the value chain, you know, there are lots of there are going to be lots of opportunities around how do you manage the assets that you've already put up on the ground. For example, in our case now, we have close to uh, 6,000 megawatts of assets that are operating. And two years from now, we'll have crossed 10,000 megawatts. Um, and the question of how, how can we get the best out of those assets is, is a very important one for us. If we can even improve the performance by 1% across our entire fleet of turbines and solar farms, that results in a fairly significant dollar number for us. And uh, there again, using software and digital and analytical tools is gonna be very critical. And there are a few companies that are starting off in that area. Um, so if I look at somebody getting into the sector right now, I think there are a couple of things which are very important beyond, of course, the immediate business opportunity. And I'm going to give you an answer which may sound generic, but is relevant for our sector as it is for perhaps some other sectors, is don't try to do something small at this point. You know, the opportunity space is vast. Go in with ambition going to try to create something really big. And because ours is a sector which, is, which has been so far a staid, uh, unexciting sector, you know, there is an opportunity to come in with new thoughts, new ideas, new views, move rapidly and take advantage and you know, get market share through any innovative ideas that you may have. The second thing which is very important to my mind, which is often underestimated, is the issue of actually building your organization capability. You know, you talked about handling scale and uh, the issue of handling scale is critical. Of course, you have to learn to execute at scale. You have to raise a bunch of capital. You have to go and deal with the government. You have to deal with equipment providers and so on. But one of the very fundamental things that you also have to do is that you have to build an organization that can scale rapidly as well. And if you don't invest in building the organization, at some point you're gonna run out of runway to grow your business anymore. And so that is not gonna sit well with your ambition to grow the business or sit well with the market or market opportunity that exists. So I would advise any young entrepreneur who's thinking about getting into our sector, certainly have a, you know, obviously have an idea that's critical, but also in parallel as you scale up, do not not look at building your organization structure. It's as important as building your business or building your product. So if I look at the combination of both your answers, I'm looking at team, I'm looking at uh, looking at a system with hardware, software as a, as a product, um, and um, you know, and and looking to and thinking big, and not to think small. I mean, that's what I'm gathering. Looking at you know, just listening to both of you, this is terrific. Let me hand it over to E 
for the next set of questions. Yeah, thanks, Alun. Uh, Sumang and Lei, you know, the reason we are have, uh, having a Zoom dialogue right here is because of COVID-19. If it's, it was not because of COVID-19, we'll have you face and face on Stanford campus, right? Having our global energy forum already. Um, now talking about COVID-19 with energy and climate change, the relationship. There are interesting observations right here. Let me just point out a few right, to, to, to pick up your uh, thought. You know, certainly we saw here in California on the road for quite a while, you see less cars. You know, but temporarily, the uh, air quality gets better. However, we also have California fire right here. That's a different story, you know, in, in the past week also. Uh, Suman, right, if I look at, look at India, uh, India ran a really interesting experiment, but it's a gigantic experiment. Um, Prime Minister uh, Modi uh, encouraged the whole nation and said, let's turn off the light at 9 p.m. April 5th for nine minutes. That was a really gigantic experiment, right? This, I mean, his main point is to show the whole nation we can still act together to do something to fight COVID-19. Um, and uh, we can go from a hopeless state to have a hope, right? I mean, this is wonderful. But certainly you think about energy implication to the grid, that's a very interesting. But this is also show as an example, you can act together. It's really powerful. Did this uh, really teach any lessons on how to manage the grid? That could be utilized for deep renewable penetration. You know, just throw out one example on, on this. So probably you can go first. I'll, I'll come to late in, in a few minutes. Sure. No, you're absolutely right, Guy, that uh, the, the Pr Prime Minister Modi did ask everybody in India to switch off their lights for nine minutes at 9 p.m. Um, you know, several months ago. And uh, it did lead to the power demand falling by about 25%. Um, but, you know, as you rightly observed, the grid was managed uh, without too much of a hassle. Of course, you know, we had the, we had the Minister of Power um, and his bureaucrats sitting in uh, control centers, making sure that nothing was going wrong. And we can't have that on a regular basis, clearly. Um, you know, but, but on a one-off basis, it worked. But the interesting thing is that subsequent to that, power demand during the period of the lockdown that was enforced for two, three months after that, power demand did fall by about 20, 25% for a couple of months before it's now got to a point where in the month of August, it's been more or less you know, at par with what, what it was last August. But for those two, three months, the way the government managed essentially um, is that they did, you know, they did a good thing in that uh, renewable energy projects in India enjoy what is called must run status under the Indian grid code, which means that renewable energy projects have to keep operating. It's a way to incentivize renewables. Also, it's a recognition of the fact that renewables, if they are asked to back down, uh, you know, lose the entire, uh, you know, in terms of uh, cost, there is no variable cost. So it's the last in the minute order of dispatch that should be getting back down. Uh, and so the entire reduction of power demand actually came from the thermal side. And, uh, and, and that really meant that coal-based plant load factors actually fell, they were already at about 60%. And in the first two months, they probably fell below 50% or thereabouts. Uh, certain plants were shut down, but the system managed. And I think in some ways, I hope it's not a blueprint for the future because we don't want to have power demand fall to that extent, obviously at any point in time, but it's a blueprint in that variability in the grid can be managed. And uh, I hope it's a lesson that policymakers have taken away that, uh, and that should allow them uh, and encourage them to have more <coughs> renewable energy capacity coming into the grid uh, going forward. And you know there is a lot of work going on on looking at intermittency management uh, through, as I said, storage solutions uh, and so on. And frankly, you don't need storage for converting renewables to baseload power. You need only storage to make renewable energy forecastable. And in India, unlike in a number of other countries, you will not have gas-based power being the balancing load. You'll actually have coal-based power being the balancing load. 
and code requires maybe a couple of hours to ramp up and ramp down. And as long as you have storage to an extent that allows, uh, you know, within two hours, renewable energy to be forecast accurately, that's the only amount of storage that we actually require. And so I think that's been the big learning from this whole experience, that uh, the amount of storage required is actually not that sizable. And renewables, uh, you know, you can have a much higher penetration of renewables into the grid. And the cost of intermittency management is not that high. Yeah, Subhan, this is excellent. You know, this um, just keep reminding, the reminding me the term of synergy. If this can be done really nicely, I mean, this is a really big positive impact. So Lei, um, are there lessons learned from COVID-19 uh, in the short term that can be used to address the climate change for the long term? In your mind, I, I, I bet you have uh, examples based on your observations in China. So uh, I have some reflections on this COVID-19 relationship to the climate change. So initially, so if you see the fast development of the COVID-19 is make people think about this is a non-linear system. So if you want to address such systematic risk, so we have to act at a very early stage and take very fast decisions and actions same thing, I think once this COVID-19 spread out, so it will be too late to contain it. So same thing for climate crisis. So if we miss the earlier time for prevention or early action, when it pick up, become the momentum, this kind of, iner the system inertial will be too difficult for us to stop. And uh, it will be almost irreversible. So for COVID-19, luckily, we human beings still are able to develop in vaccine. However, so there's no vaccine for climate crisis. Once the catastrophe is being developed. So it will be too late for mankind. So, so that's my reflection. No vaccine for climate crisis. We have to act early and take a very rapid, rapid actions. Lei, I really like what you just said because it's so important. Let me repeat it. There's no vaccine for uh, climate crisis, for everybody of us, we got to know that no vaccine for that. Thank you so much for uh, saying this and uh, th thinking through this. Alun, I will return back to you for you to ask the next question. Sure, uh, thanks, Yi. And it is, it's interesting here about the vaccine for climate change. I'm hoping that technology could be a potential and early adoption of the technology uh, could perhaps help, uh, but you're right. I mean, there is, we have to act quickly. And one of the areas that we're seeing a tectonic shift that's going on in just a technological transformation is the area of tra transportation and the introduction of electric vehicles. A lithium ion battery costs, I know E does a lot of research in that. Lithium ion battery costs are approaching $100 a kilowatt hour in the next couple of years. Uh, uh, and which will make electric vehicles cost and range competitive with gasoline cars. Uh, Lei, you're building a gigafactory in China. Um, so my question to you is how far can the battery cost go down, number one? And second, China has 3.3 million EVs on the road, which is roughly equal to that in Europe and US combined. So what is China doing that is enabling this transformation? Yes, if we look back 10 years ago, so the battery cost is almost 1,000 US dollar per kilo hour. So 10 years later, 
today, we are able to reach the 150 US dollar per kilo hour or even less. However, within next two or three years, it, it will be almost certain we can achieve below 100 US dollar per kilo hour. But this is not ending point. So according to our study and the research, especially on this upstream value chain of raw materials, there's still big potential to going down further to eventually to be the around 50 US dollar per kilo hour, I think in five or six years time. So which is going to be totally change, changed the game. So from the point you mentioned about Chinese government policy, I think uh, the biggest motivation from China to promote EV is come from the environment pressure. So, you know, a few years ago, people are suffering a lot from this you know, smoggy weather. And uh, also Chinese leadership made such a statement. The green mountain and the river is our new treasure. So we are shaping the new values, new value for environment. Such kind of uh, mentality shift we, is, is stimulating this renewable energy productions, equipment produ productions, also about EV production. So, no, so for people giving the subsidy, buying, e buying EVs, give them green card plate, which is in China is so difficult to get a new car card plate for, for, for your new cars. So for instance, one, my hair, hairdresser, a few years ago, I think five years ago, he bought uh, a new EV. I, I'm quite amazed. I thought it's, it's normally rich people buy EV, but he told me, okay, the reason he buy EV is, he bought EV is, is operating cost is so cheap. At the same time, he doesn't need to wait like a few months to have to auction the, a new plate because with the EV, it's almost, you know, it will be immediately you get the green card. So um, it, it basically government policy, and this was driven initially by, by air pollution, uh, really mattered. And, you know, we were just talking before this uh, discussion started so much with Samant that now because of COVID-19, air pollution has gone down. You can actually see the mountains from about 200 kilometers away now that the air is clear. So Samant, let me come to you. Um, India has air pollution issues as well. And is that driving the electrification? And of course, India has a massive fleet of two and three wheelers, more than cars. So, which is quite unique in the, in the world in terms of scale. So how difficult is it to electrify the transportation in India to get to maintain the clear sky uh, so that you can see the mountains? And are you guys doing anything in Renew Power to provide the charging infrastructure for EVs. So how are you thinking, how, what is, how is India thinking and how are you thinking about it? Yeah, you know, I think clearly electric vehicles are very, very critical. Um, today, uh, a lot of the pollution that we see in urban centers in India is vehicular in nature. And um, as you rightly observed, you know, with uh, this lockdown that we've had over the last few months, uh, the quality of air has improved dramatically. And it's been a real learning for all of us to see, uh, other than understanding theoretically what the benefits might be, to actually live through the benefits, see clearer skies, you know, see, see longer distances. And as you said, from certain cities in India now begin to see the, the Himalayas. And so I think we've all come to realize the benefits of having cleaner air. So hopefully that's something that stays with us, you know, post uh, pandemic going away. Uh, which hopefully will happen in not too long or distant future. But to answer your question about EVs, the government certainly sees with the need to have uh, an EV rollout happening relatively fast. Uh, they're still thinking through what are the right incentives and mechanisms for making that happen. So at this point, 
there are no clear i think uh, or not sufficient incentives that have been given to really get a lot of the large car companies to start moving to ev manufacturing we, we don't really see that happening but i do see that there is a push towards moving towards uh, moving public transportation buses and so on towards electric vehicles and as you also rightly observed two wheelers and three wheelers are moving towards becoming electric and that perhaps is going to happen faster than it will happen for passenger cars for example and and the reason for that is that uh, two wheeler and three wheeler operators i think are seeing the economic value of uh, having uh, electric uh, you know batteries and uh, therefore just purely because of the commercial reason uh, there's a lot of movement among that uh, which are mostly commercial in nature towards moving towards electric uh, uh, vehicles and i think that really is what has been driving it so far uh the government certainly wants to incentivize much more going forward and i think policies and plans are in in the works um and i think we will probably see very soon that there will be more incentivization towards electric vehicles as we go forward uh we clearly haven't had the kind of uh, move yet that china has had and so in that sense i think we are playing uh, catch up to some extent um uh, in terms of what models will emerge and therefore what will we do you know one of the things that is not yet clear to me is whether we will have uh, electric vehicles where batteries will get swapped out and then charged and then replaced or will we have chargeable batteries uh, you know people are working on both options and so yeah, i i think it's not yet clear as to which model is finally going to succeed um, and we'll have to wait and see how that uh, plays out so we are being a little bit cautious on looking at electric vehicles because the only play for a company like ours really is to look at it from a charging standpoint and at this point as i said because of this lack of uh, clarity as to what model is eventually going to emerge we don't want to venture into it until and unless you know we have a better sense of uh, understanding as to how that might play out perfect so uh, as many of you know if you watched this uh, dialogue before you know we we have a student section which is really important And so let me take this opportunity to introduce two highly accomplished Stanford students, Vivas Kumar and Hannah Sieber. Vivas is an MBA student at the Sta Stanford Graduate School of Business. Before joining Stanford, Vivas was at Tesla where he was responsible for managing the whole battery supply chain strategy and procurement for Tesla. He had established that for Tesla. And Hannah is also an MBA student at the at the business school and she is the co-founder and CEO of a company called EcoFlow which is a pioneering portable um company power company that builds solar cells and rechargeable batteries to replace fuel generators and she started EcoFlow from an apartment in Shenzhen and built it into a global company with sales in the US EU Japan and and China so over to you Vivas and Hana thank you very much professor majumdar and professor um Tway for inviting us to be here today and of course once again I'd like to echo the thanks to Lay and Sumanth for joining us here. So I'll start off with a question for Lay and then hand it off to Hana after that. Lay. In a couple of your previous public presentations you've stated that 1 cent per kilowatt <clears> hour <throat> 1 cent per kilowatt hour pricing is on the horizon for renewables. And Earlier today you mentioned the importance of software integrating software to the way that operators and service providers can work so that they can escape a downward spiral of unsustainable margins. Can you expand a little bit more on your idea around integrating artificial intelligence, machine learning and software solutions for consumption and distribution balancing? Sure. So you know the renewable energy system what we can see is fully automated so no one is running the wind farm is like autonomous driving the wind turbine running by itself and the solar farm as well also with storage and this kind of renewable devices they are driven by very unpredictable weather system from solar from wind and this energy and being transferred to the substation to network and to the electric vehicles 
and to the eye conditioners and to, to the homes. So what we can see is this new renewable energy system is become very automated and interconnected and also intermittent and uh, unpredictable. So especially we are coming to a stage to this, the renewable, our demand is going to be shaped by the supply. In the past is supply is determined by demand, but now is demand is shaped by supply. So you can see lots of flexibility is needed by the system. So that's why we can see that I conditioner could provide flexibility or the electric vehicle can most of the time become the stationary storage when they are not moving. So th this kind of energy exchange and the flexibility injection to the system. So they are not the only one devices. So these devices become the network defined devices. So because you have to trade with the system using how much energy you are going to give back, how much energy you are going to curtail, and at what time, at what place, and uh, with which counterparty. So lots of data is going to be feed into the one machine, and this one machine also to dealing with the multiple devices. So lots of data is, is, is not going to be worked by a conventional human operators. So this kind of billions of devices acting together, you need such kind of machine learning mechanisms. And also to the best way is take pe people out of this uh, machine loop. That's what I envision said, we are going to create the machine social network. Within the machine social network basically is IoT plus AI. So give to create such kind of automation, intelligent automation. So that's my explanation. Awesome. Another one for you, Lei. So last year, China was the world's leader in both coal and renewables installations. And as we look ahead uh, to the release of China's 14th five-year plan next year, what are your expectations around how renewables expansion policy will change into the new plan? Yes, I'm, I'm quite optimistic. So I would expect at least 100 gigawatt renewable energy will be added for the next five years every year. However, maybe there are still some people think they are going to add lots of coal-fired power plant as well. But I think that it's, you know, even you make a plan, people prove the plan sometimes is not accurate. So I strongly believe by 2025, renewable energy will be grow from today's 15% non-fossil fuel energy, including uh, hydro, from 15% to around 22%. You know why? Although there's some company is still in favor or still like to invest fossil fuel, but their motivation for investing for fossil fuel has been changed. In the past, there's only for, you know, the energy production, but they, this same category of investor, so they are also investing on renewables. So they realize renewable is more cost competitive. The reason why they are still investing on the coal-fired power plant is because they want to combine coal-fired power plant with renewable together to shape, to, to become a steady supplier. However, as I said, the storage cost is dropping dramatically. So within two years time, I think the storage, the cost of storage energy for per kilowatt hour will decrease below to 
two US cents per kilo hour. Then the storage we are going is going to replace the coal power plant to be the best supplement of renewable. So that will become new new norm. Today, lots of investors haven't realized that. But in two years' time, when the price is, is come to that level, then people are rational. They, 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 they will realize the fossil fuel power plant will become a strategic asset. So then renewable plus energy storage, that's the ultimate solution. So that's why I'm so optimistic. Thank you, Lei. We're excited for your optimism. Um, Sumat, turning to you, you stated in a Bloomberg interview last year that renewable businesses are often misunderstood by equity investors. How has the push towards ESG investing changed equity investors' perceptions of the power sector? Well, you know, I, I made that remark, Hannah, in the context of um, equity investors, uh, primarily in India. And what happened in India is that uh, in the beginning, uh, there were a number of private companies that got into the coal-based sector. And a lot of them did not plan their uh, projects properly. They went ahead without proper uh, access to coal, without proper uh, uh, power purchase agreements, uh, and so on. And so they unfortunately came to grief. And so did, uh, along with them, their investors. And so investors therefore got burned quite badly in, in some of those investments. And so therefore, when now renewable energy companies go to some of the same investors, I think investors have the view that, look, this is you know, a power sector, another version of the same power sector investment opportunity. And therefore they react with the same trepidation or apprehension uh, arising out of the losses of investing in the coal sector in India. Uh, unfortunately, what they don't realize is, is, is that renewables is totally, totally different. We don't have any fuel risk. Uh, you know, we don't set up a project without power purchase agreements in place. And so therefore two of the biggest risks are actually addressed uh, in a fairly straightforward manner in renewable energy projects. So I think that was the context in which I had made those remarks. But to your broader question about ESG, I think ESG is clearly a massive phenomenon. I think it's, it's only going to grow as we go forward. Uh, we're just at the infancy of that whole move at this point in time. And we are seeing more and more large sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, institutional investors uh, beginning to start shifting their focus. Uh, even, even college, uh, university endowment funds and so on are now saying, we don't want to invest in coal. And as that noise become, becomes more and more, two things will happen. And you're interestingly seeing some of that play out. Number one, people will become a lot more wary and careful about investing in coal-based projects. So that automatically will begin to go down uh, as, as people see the reluctance of international investors or any kind of investors to invest in coal projects. So coal projects will just be much harder to get off the ground. That is one. The second very interesting thing, and I don't know whether you guys have seen this or not, uh, but probably would have given the fact that you're, that you're all smart Stanford MBA students, uh, is that if you look at the market cap of ExxonMobil, for example, a few years ago, it was the biggest market cap stock in the world at about a $400 billion market cap. Today, its market cap is down to $150 billion. Very interesting, right? A company like Orsted, which is a pure, uh, which, is a, which is a Danish uh, uh, wind energy company, does mostly offshore wind. Their market cap has gone up almost 3x in literally in the last one year. And their market cap is now about $70 billion. Next era's market cap is now about $140 billion. And so you're getting to a point now where you're going to start seeing the large renewable energy companies suddenly go up in value higher than the incumbent large oil and gas companies of the world. And when that shift begins to happen more and more, it will give more ammunition to the renewable energy companies to start raising capital more easily and at better valuations. And therefore, more capital will automatically continue to focus, flow into those companies. And so that's going to become a self-fulfilling prophecy, which is really what we're in the beginning stages of. Now, Tesla, where, of course, uh, you work, uh, is, is an extreme example of that, where the market cap of Tesla goes up by 10% almost every day. 
and it's now up at 450 billion dollars as of at least this morning i don't know where it might be now maybe another 10 percent higher but uh, the the market cap of tesla is now bigger than as we all know than all the oil and then all the auto companies on the other side put together it's it's simply unbelievable so the power of vsg investing i think is just beginning now and a lot of uh, boards hopefully including ours will move up to the rising tide Thank you, Suman. One more question for you. Financial inclusion, access to capital, and renewable energy development go hand in hand, just in the way that you described it with ESG investing, but also when it comes to sort of at the individual customer level, that's true. Can you talk us through some of the steps that you would like see being implemented towards greater financial inclusivity and whether traditional financial institutions will continue to see to institutions like shadow banking in the long term in India? Yeah, so that's a broader financial market question. Um, and what is clearly already happening in India is that, you know, under the current prime minister's uh, efforts, we now have a situation where every single individual in the country has been allowed to open a bank account. And by doing that, uh, and a certain amount of money has been put into their account, and that has now made it possible for all the subsidy schemes that, of, that used to operate earlier imperfectly, because they used to have to go through multiple channels, now can be paid on a targeted basis directly to the end consumer or the end individual. And so, for example, giving power sector subsidies, where earlier you were giving a subsidy to all agricultural consumers of power by essentially uh, putting tariff, uh, price, you know, tariffs for agricultural consumption down to almost zero. Now you can actually start charging people the actual cost of power and separately give them a subsidy directly into the bank account. And you can give it to them on, a, on a much more targeted basis, much more to the needy people rather than the rich, let's say the rich farmers. And I think that is going to make the whole issue of subsidies a lot more efficient. And it is also therefore hopefully going to bring down the subsidy bill and at the same time, lead to better outcomes. So that is something that is really happening as a result of this whole issue of financial inclusion that now the government has really been pushing on very rapidly and very fast. But behind this, there is another aspect of financial inclusivity at a, more macro, at a much more macro level, which is really at the, at the level of, of countries on a multilateral basis. Um, you know, this energy transition that we're in the midst of, um, you know, the question is, is, is a ton of carbon saved in India versus a ton of carbon saved in Europe? You know, how, should we not be looking at the cost of a ton of carbon saved all over the world? And should money then not flow entirely without boundaries and without borders into whichever are those schemes in whichever countries there might be where you can actually save in the most cost efficient manner, that one ton of carbon. And that is something that is really not happening right now. What you're seeing is people are still investing and devoting all this money or subsidies or stimulus programs, green stimulus programs within their boundaries. And so it could very well be that the money that the world as a whole is spending today on carbon emissions reductions initiatives are actually being spent unwisely. And we have to find ways of targeting that spending in a much better, more effective manner. And it could be that perhaps all the money has to go into Africa for all I know, right? Or maybe it stays in Europe. But there should be some analysis of that. And I don't see that happening. People are still very insular. And to the point that we were discussing about COVID earlier, you can seal off your boundaries and prevent people from coming into your country and thereby stave off COVID. But you can't stave off climate change by shutting your boundaries, you know, because we're all really in the same globe together. And so therefore, we have to act much more multilaterally, and especially when it comes to financial uh, spends. Thank you, Sumant. We have one last question from students, and this is for both Sumant and Leigh. As we've talked about earlier today, one point of tension is the fact that on one hand, China and India have rapid industrialization plans, but developed nations have said that there is a tension between those rapid industrialization plans and the Paris Accords. 
So how would you advocate to your governments to balance the clean air mandates on one hand with continuing to build coal to provide the economic growth tailwind? Should I go first? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. So look, I, I, in, at, at the Paris Climate Accord, India made some fairly uh, gutsy commitments. Um, one of those was to essentially get renewable energy up to 40% of the total power generating capacity by 2030. Another was to increase the forest cover by a certain fairly significant percentage. Um, and a third was to really improve energy efficiency of the economy by a certain percentage, again, by 2030. So, I, I, you know, we, I think, as a country, went over and above what might have been expected of us. And we are now very seriously and very earnestly trying to move down that path as, as much as possible. And I think we're going to be quite successful in actually meeting most of our INDC commitments. Now, you might argue that those commitments could have been a little bit steeper and so on. But given where we started from, and this is back in 2015, keep in mind, at, the, at a point when renewable energy was still more expensive than thermal power. Uh, and so therefore, to make that commitment at that time, I, th I think, as I said earlier, was, was a gutsy thing to have done. And by 2030, it might very well be that we, ex that we exceed those targets. Now, at the same time, the reality is, as I had mentioned in my opening remarks, that to support India's growth, given our very poor per capita consumption of electricity, we will need to have other sources of power generation coming in as well. And those will necessarily have to be coal. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to build a lot more new coal plants. But the issue is we already have existing coal plants where the plant load factors are very low. And so those can just be increased. So there will be, therefore, an increase in carbon emissions uh, from the country. But as a percentage of our GDP, it will come down. And if you look at almost any metric uh, of carbon emissions per, per capita or per uh, unit of GDP, you will find that India is already much, much lower than most of the, developing, or most of the developed countries are. So you know, without, without being too, um, uh, I guess, patriotic, for want of a better word, I would say that it is really more income. It is really incumbent more on the developed countries to bring their emissions to come down faster than it is on developing countries like India, which are still on the development path. For us to look at curtailing beyond what we've already committed to curtail, which is quite significant, by the way. And let's hope that in the U.S. there is a more positive outcome in the elections from a climate change perspective, so that the U.S. actually does join the bandwagon of countries like India and China. Lay, any response to that? Yes, <clears throat> as I said, so when I, so there are about two categories of people. One is the investor, another category is the government. When I talk to the, the CEOs of Chinese big utility companies, so most of them already realize the coal plant is going to become the stranded asset. So the the only reason they are still investing a small amount of coal-fired plant is because the combination with renewable to be able to export through the high voltage line. So again, as I said, that's, that's the synergy issue, the synergy between renewable and the fossil fuel to give the stable output. However, so we can easily convince them that storage, energy storage is going to become the new coal. We already see the energy storage in lots of market is replacing gas power stations. So which is only around a few hundred hours a year can be easily replaced by energy storage. With the decreasing cost of energy storage, I think they can also replace the coal fire plant on the flexibility. So then I think, so which will become very apparent for people to, to choose energy storage. Regarding the category of government, so I'll give you an example, the Jiangsu province, so when I talk to Jiangsu province is the richest province in China, just close by Shanghai. 
when talk when I talk to the leader of Jiangsu province energy sectors, so they they told us for the next five years they are going to build fifty gigawatt wind and solar. Do you know how much coal plant they are planning? They are only planning two gigawatt coal plant. However, this two gigawatt coal plant is is just as a backup, which means most like if the system works well, if the flexibility or synergy issue gets solved, they may not need this two gigawatt coal fire plant. So what I can see is on the government policy sector. So not only government need this top level target for renewable energy target, but also this target should be able to break down to the individual province. So the motivation behind the Jiangsu province is come from their renewable energy target, which has already been assigned to them, which have pushed them to have to develop renewable energy. So I'm seeing in China, so the trend is doing well. So with the next few years, when the cost improve further, so so you know renewable is definitely is um, become more popular. So we have ten minutes left, and we want to ask as many questions from the audience. So uh, Sumanth and Lei, we request you some short, quick answers. And so let me start with E. Um, e, you want to ask the first audience question? Yes, of course. Um, a lot of good questions coming up, right? So. Uh, the first one is from uh, our friend Jad Verden. I, I think Jad doesn't mind I mention his name. Uh, what role will nuclear energy play in the future generation mix of Ch for China and India? Uh, Suman, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think that nuclear is not going to play a big role, uh, certainly in India. It takes, I think, too long to build. The costs are very expensive. The flexibility is not that high. And so I see really no, nobody who's going to be willing to invest in large nuclear facilities. There's also the issue of getting fuel and then disposing of the nuclear waste. So it's just a very complicated uh, you know, uh, thing to be putting up right now. And I really don't see a lot of interest either from governments or from the private sector in investing in large nuclear plants going forward. And Lei? Yeah, I think the nuclear in China will be marginal as well. So economic wise, so nuclear has new has no advantage. If we look at the cost of renewable, it's going down. Nuclear cost is going up. So the facts have the reality have already proved the simple is better, the modular is better. So wind and solar is simple and modular. It's not complicated. Complicated engineering things always costly. Is, is not a way for energy. Back to you, Alan. Okay, great. Next question. Uh, when we discuss renewables penetration in terms of percentage, do we predict the denominator, that is the total demand correctly? That is, do we include EVs or, or when, we, when the demand keeps increasing, you think renewables will face problems of catching up with demand? Uh, Lace, yes. you wanna go first? Yeah, I think it is, uh, so for our scenario is uh, we are assuming still three to 5% uh, the energy growth, especially for electricity growth, because the big theme is about electrification. Lots of fossil fuel, liquid fossil fuel or solid is turning to the electricity. So we definitely, we should take into account for, for the overall electricity growth. So our scenario is definitely included. So what? So in our case, we assume about maybe a 6% uh, growth in, in electricity uh, year on year. And uh, I think to be honest with you, in the next few years, we're gonna be hard pressed even just to meet that incremental demand from renewable energy. Uh, it's you know it's gonna require a lot of construction of renewable energy projects to, 
to meet that 6% demand growth here. Perfect. P, over to yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, next question, Suman, is for uh, for you. This is from our Stanford alumni, Professor Stan Whittingham. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize last year for uh, inventing lithium-ion batteries. So uh, he's a big supporter of Stanford Energy event. Uh, Stan has a question for you about two and three wheelers. It's a uh, combustion base. Does India have the requirement to have all these two, three wheelers to go all electrical? and ban the combustion base. And uh, he believes China's already been doing this. Uh, what's India's uh, you know, policy on that? So, you know, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure what the policy is on two and three wheelers, but I do know that a fairly significant percentage, just by anecdotal observation, I can see is already um, electrified. And uh, that is the area that the government believes is going to be the easiest area to look at electrifying to begin with. That along, as I said, uh, with suburban bus transportation. So that's the area that they're going after. I don't know that an explicit target has been set by the government so far, but certainly uh, the move is, is, is in that direction. Okay, so uh, this is about storage. I, I think we all agree that storage is gonna be very important in the future. Um, but this is about seasonal storage. Um, what do you expect the storage solution to be to manage large differences in seasonal consumption within summer and winter. Any thoughts, Lei? I think hydrogen. Hydrogen will be very critical for the seasonal storage. Okay, Sumant? So, you know, I think that there is sufficient uh, flex in the, in the coal-based capacity in India that you can ramp up and ramp down the coal-based capacity to give you, in some ways, seasonal balancing that is required. But in India, there is also this, uh, this benefit that you have a natural um, uh, inverse correlation between solar and wind. So you have the majority of the wind that blows in the monsoon months, which is, uh, let's say, um, in some ways May to, um, to August, September. And that's also some of the time when, therefore, because of that, that uh, the cloud cover, that the solar radiation also comes down. So in some ways, it, there's an automatic balancing out of it. As well, that happens. Let me ask a question to Lay. I mean, this is, uh, you made a very important statement. There is no vaccine for climate crisis. And so the question out here is from one of the audience members, when is it too late to address climate crisis? Is it too late now? Uh, define what is uh, late, too late, what, what does it really mean? I think probably is already being quite late now. So, but uh, we still, we should never give up. We still have a chance. So, because this system is still, is still quite non-linear, we, we don't know that clear as yet. But according to scientists, so we're almost running out of time. So we have really speed up. Great, uh, this has been a wonderful conversation. Um, Sumant and Lei, uh, do you have any final, just uh, quick statements before we sort of wrap up? Um, Sumant, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Arun. Thanks a lot for inviting me for this absolutely fascinating session. And I got to learn a lot from Leigh as well. Some of the questions were really insightful. And getting asked a question by Nobel laureate, that, that's pretty <laughs> fabulous as well. So very exciting session. Uh, just to give you a quick answer on the last question that you asked, whether it's too late. I think it is too late. I think in some ways we've, we've kind of missed the bus on the one and a half degrees some time ago. We've probably also missed the bus on the two degrees. And I think we're fighting a losing battle right now for three degrees centigrade temperature change. So, uh, but we, I guess we have to do as much as we can because otherwise we're gonna be looking at even more dramatic consequences to the, to the environment and to climate change. So I think we have to just keep pushing at it as hard as we can. And I think everybody needs to put in whatever effort they can to try to stave off as much of the climate change that is upon us and will continue to be upon us. Lay final words of wisdom. You know, although there is no vaccine for climate crisis, but there's still some hope. So if we have to find a vaccine for climate crisis, that's the renewables. We have to inject as much as renewable into our energy system. That's probably, that's the only vaccine. 
Well, Leigh and Suman, thank you very much for joining us today for this wonderful discussion. And I want to take this opportunity to thank my colleague, Each Way, as well as our students, Vivas and Hannah, for joining, and, and all the people in our team at Stanford uh, who made this Global Energy Dialogue possible. And thank you to all of you for joining us around the world. We hope you found today's Global Energy Dialogue informative and relevant during these unprecedented times. And, and please join us two weeks from now for a conversation with Ann Finucane, Vice Chairman of Bank of America on sustainable energy finance. And again, please register on our website at gef.stanford.edu and note the date and time, September 15th, 8.30 to 10 a.m. California time. And with that, thank you again. Let's adjourn.